And I will say though, with the communion video, I thought that video was gonna be the video to lighten the mood, to take it down like less serious or whatnot. But I didn't understand, you know, the reality of what it is. You know, it's me eating the communion, which is like the symbolism of like Jesus's blood and, and bones or something like that. Close enough. Welcome to the Sean Bowl Show. And today's show, we got a show. I mean, there's so much to talk about right now in the world in general, but we are going to talk about how Trump won Iowa. And so many of the cases against him are imploding right now. And we have so many, so many things to talk about just with that. I mean, we've talked about some of the things that have been happening in Biden's world uh, just a few months ago. Now we're talking about Trump's world. Super interesting. You're going to want to stay tuned. We also have some encounters with Jesus's love happening on the Chosen series. This time it's with Zebedee or the man who plays Zebedee. You don't want to miss that either because there's so many God moments on the Chosen and we're going to watch one and react to it together. And then Little Nas, Little Nas X is in a season where he's calling it his Christian phase. He unfortunately has blasphemed Jesus in the grossest way in Hollywood history, but then said, just kidding, sorry, not sorry. I wanted to not necessarily apologize. I want to take a look at his apology, but also a little bit about the blasphemy of what he did, because he's using Christianity and Satanism and all these things to promote his brand. And this is really awful. And we want to just address this and look at it together with a discerning eye. Then I have a clip about my upcoming Sunday prophetic perspective, and it's all about three things that God told me for you in 2024. So you don't want to miss a beat. Subscribe to this channel and save this video or hit notifications and come join me in the chat because I want to hear your perspective. Like I love chatting with you guys. If you haven't seen me in the chat yet, you will in the future because I'm I'm in every video. I'm personally talking. It's not my team. It's me. I can't wait to chat with you on YouTube. If you're listening on podcasts, leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you there as well. But before we get into the first story, I wanted to tell you about my best selling book, Translating God. It's the most practical way. It's story based that you can learn how to hear from God. And we're having the biggest sale in our history on it. We have the book, the workbook, and the online masterclass for only $20. I and mean, that's a huge deal. Just go to bowlsministries.com. And I want you to get your hands on this today because God really wants to give you an understanding of what he's telling you for 2024. So go to bowlsministries.com and grab your kit. You'll see it on the front page or go to the store and you'll see it right in there where you, when you order the book, you're going to get those two free things, the workbook and also the masterclass online, which is so good. Well, let's get right into story number one. This is a story. to pay their respects to the former leader of these United States of America. Donald Trump is a massive UFC fan. He's watching our fight nights at home, but he has been omnipresent at our live events this year. And he well, it's been quite a month for Trump. He won Iowa in a victory that no Republican has done for decades, and he had Democratic pollsters, like the main pollsters of the Democratic Party, are all agreeing that if the presidential elections were today, that he would win over Biden. And he's also about to announce his VP candidate. On top of this, a lot of the cases against him are crumbling. And I have a couple I want to talk about today. But remember Fannie Willis, who built her whole election run on taking down Trump and locking him up. She kept saying, lock him up, lock him up. Well, it seems she's not only sleeping with one of her special prosecutors she hired to work on the election interference case against Trump. The lawyer, Nathan Wade, and her received taxpayer money from the work on the Trump case, which is not only unethical, but their special hearing is scheduled for disciplinary conduct. Uh, it's getting scheduled right now. So this could make the case completely go away because the probability of someone else backing her up or somebody else taking on her role of this level of what I think was arrogance on the in the first place probably won't happen, but we'll see if she gets removed from it or not. But either way, what she did was so unethical she went to church, though, right after it. She asked for grace, for indiscretion, but wasn't really repentive. Was just saying, we have to help, you know, strong black women, you know, fight the fight and do Jesus' work. And you know, we all fail. We all stumble. We, you need to let me stumble. It was so demonic, the way that she repented, and so exhausting, the way she repented, because it was, a, it was a defense mechanism, not a love mechanism, not a Jesus mechanism. And Nathan Wade is married, the man she had an affair with. I think he's going through a divorce now, but he's been married this whole time they've been going through this. But I want to look at a clip from Dr. Steve Turley, who's a conservative commentary voice and a theologian, and he's helping the world look at some of the details about these kinds of cases right now. So let's look at that clip. We are at a time in history when you can no longer sit back and just let other folks do. You cannot expect black 
women to be perfect and save the world. The Lord is completing us. We are not perfect. We need your prayers. We need to be allowed to stumble. We need grace. With that kind of support, we will move mountains and do Jesus' will. Stumbling all the way. This is like a Christian cult. I mean, we don't say after having an affair for months using government money to go on extravagant trips, we don't say, hey, forget about that. Move that over. We need to do the Lord's work and be strong. And this is just part of it. It's just part of it is being a, a black woman who stumbled, but I'm strong and we're going to do the Lord's work. This is this is demonic. <laughs> well, apparently that stumbling involved this corrupt DA, not only having an affair with a prosecutor, but most of all, they both allegedly profited off the indictments against Trump. More and more pundits are coming to the conclusion that the lawfare efforts against Trump carried out by our corrupt ruling establishment are indeed backfiring. And they're backfiring largely because of how desperate these fledgling cases against Trump all appear to be. We have to remember here, as Victor Davis Hansen has recently pointed out, none of these indictments would ever have happened had Trump decided not to run for president again. These indictments are deliberately intended to keep him out of the White House. All of the trial dates have been deliberately synchronized so as to ensure that the front-running Trump, who again is beating both his fellow Republicans and Biden in every single poll out there, all the trial dates are being synchronized so as to keep Trump tied up in courtrooms and effectively out of the 2024 campaign trail. And this is what they're calling in the Republican Party and a lot of the conservative commentators are calling it lawfare, not warfare, lawfare, because they're putting these these incredible cases against him. Now, again, and listen to me. I'm not, I, I think Trump has a lot of character issues. I think there's a lot going on. But when it comes to me voting in the next election, it's between Biden and Trump. We've already had four years of Trump. We know what Trump does. We've had four years of Biden and we know what Trump, Biden doesn't do. And there's so much in the corruption of what Biden's currently doing that's not being held accountable. And then people are working with Biden and with the Democratic Party like this woman they're getting away with so much and they're they're shamelessly asking you to look past it so that they can go after Trump. They want to arrest him. They want to lock him up so bad. They want to keep him out of this election so bad that they don't care what they have to do to get it done. They're doing lawfare. They're doing all kinds of stuff. Well, in other words, they're deliberately putting him on trial to keep him off the trail. But one by one, all of these cases appear to be collapsing. And the key here again, as VDH reminds us, as each desperate attempt at lawfare ends up failing, that doesn't return things to zero. It's not like we just go back to the way things were before the use of weaponized legalism. No, all of these corrupt efforts to take Trump out serve as force multipliers for each other. The more they try to persecute Trump, the more his poll numbers go up, the more they discredit themselves, the more voters see Democrats as the true insurrectionists who are threatening the integrity of our democratic republic. And that's what's interesting too. When you think about how hard people are working against Trump, it really is working for him. And when you think about how hard, they're not just doing normal like, hey, you shouldn't vote for Trump. These are the policy reasons why. This is what we represent as a party. They're villainizing and demonizing him and trying to make him look like a criminal. Then they're judging everybody who's alongside of him for being a white supremacist or being, if they're black, then they're they're not truly black people. I'm sorry, <laughs> what? You ain't black. I mean, they're, they're, everything's being said on MSNBC, everything on ABC News, like these news channels that are following all the anti-Trump rhetoric, like even after the Iowa, uh, after he stormed into Iowa and just took it from the Republican party, and no one's ever done this before. And you have one of the commentators, one of the journalists saying on a newscaster who's saying, you know, this is Christian white nationalists who are voting for him. And I'm like, where did Christians get villainized because they don't want what the Democrat Party is offering right now? It's not a black white thing. It's not a it's not a white versus the country thing. It's a, a migration or immigration migration. Uh.
It's an immigration issue. It's it's a complete issue of corruption in the White House itself. There was cocaine in the White House recently, and it ended up being one of Biden's family members. We don't know who, but we know that much from the FBI. There's so many things that have happened across the board where the economy is so bad that the average person is behind financially every year that Biden's in office. And it's, it's now compiling enough to where the average person just wants a normal life. They just want an American dream, and there's no American dream under Bidenomics. And so people are watching on every level such radical failure, especially when it comes to international policy. Ukraine wouldn't have happened on a, a man like Trump's watch. It probably wouldn't have happened on a Obama's watch. It wouldn't have happened on Clinton's watch. It wouldn't have happened on Reagan's watch. But it happened on Biden's watch. And Afghanistan was such a nightmare. The suburban mamas who were told, like, he's going to bring peace and that Biden was going to be the man for you and he's going to bring justice. It was a lie because they watched troops get killed. They watched all kinds of good people left behind in Afghanistan. We've seen such a terrible thing happen through Biden that that's why people are willing to align with Trump. Even if they don't like him, they know what is happening in his government. I had a friend of mine who said, you know, uh, he was afraid when Trump got elected because Trump would have the nuclear codes. Can they have someone who has a backup plan, please? Because this is scary. But during Trump's time, there's no war. There was zero war in Trump's time. He actually kept peace better than anyone else. He had the Abraham Accords, all the different things. Then in Biden's time, when he was, my friend was kind of excited, Biden was uh, elected because he thought, well, Biden will be a lot safer. It's all war. I mean, the Middle East is a wreck right now because of Biden. Ukraine and Eastern Europe is a wreck right now because of Biden. We have Afghanistan has been a disaster zone because of Biden. This doesn't happen on any other president's watch. And so the fact that people are turning against the Democrat Party and saying, I'll vote for Trump. I mean, the BLM leaders, leaders of Black Lives Matter are endorsing President Trump. We're watching celebrities on a a level that we're like, Trump is the evil one. The enemy are saying, you have to vote for Trump. You can't vote for Biden because we can't go down this pathway anymore. So I think it's really interesting when you watch this, when you discern differently, once the election time comes, we'll see what's going on at that time. If Biden can make it all the way there because he's not even coherent at this point, but we're going to see what happens. Let's start with Fannie Willis, who you saw at the beginning of the video She's trying to hide behind the veneer of religiosity to shield her so true. from the allegations that have turned her case into shambles. She is being accused of allegedly having an ongoing affair with one of her subordinates, Fulton County Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. She's not just being accused anymore. She's admitted it. She then appointed Wade as prosecutor in Trump's case, even though, get this, even though he's never tried a single felony case in his entire career. He was previously just a personal injury accident lawyer. Again, the president, former president of the United States, is getting prosecuted by this team. This team that's an unholy alliance built on sin, built on a totally demonic perspective. Like he said, they they would never brought this case if Trump wasn't running again. So they're trying to eliminate him from the presidential race. And it's imploding. You can't build your house on a sandy land. You know, this is this is crazy. So she's allegedly having this affair with the prosecutor that she picked to lead the case against Trump. Then she turned around and allegedly paid him an inordinate amount of money to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Taxpayers' money. So that's just normal taxpayers are losing their good money. They can go for all kinds of things. Education, anyone, any of these areas. The black community is suffering because of what this woman's doing. And guess what they together did with that money? They went on extravagant vacations and getaways like a Royal Caribbean cruise and the like. So when all is said and done, Fannie Willis and her alleged boy toy are being accused of personally profiting off this sham prosecution against Trump. That's the key allegation in all of this. Fannie Willis and her alleged lover have been financially benefiting off this sham prosecution. So her case is an absolute shambles. Yeah, one of the things to say about that is that there's some uh, journalism out there that's saying that well, they didn't use the taxpayer money to go on these cruises because it's confirmed they've been on the cruises and these vacations. But in their history, they've never had on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, anywhere else, any kind of cruise or vacation on this extravagant magnitude before. So they both weren't of economic standing to be able to go on these levels of vacations. And this man had never taken his wife on a vacation like this that they could find from the past. But they had pictures together on these vacations that have now since been deleted. So this is, it just shows you that the level of corruption that's there. 
that even if they didn't pay the taxpayers money, which there's going to be an investigation into it of how these things were paid for, which they had to do. They did go on some trips, quote unquote trips to do investigation. No one can find any other trips. The only trips they could find is the vacations. So there's some trouble here and they have a future date. They'll have, I think it's already set now is, um, potentially of disciplinary action. Well, let's look at the New York case. And I like Facts Matter with Roman Bamakov, who's uh, with Epoch Times. And this is the New York case where Trump was finally able to make a pretty shocking courtroom move. He was able to uh, speak in front of the judge and in front of everybody else and share his end. So the judge had already said, I believe Trump's guilty, but now we're just going to find out how guilty we're going to find out how much money he should pay in this whole case and up to the tunes of 250 to 350 million dollars. And so they were already judging him as guilty. There was no jury. Um, they, they were fast tracking this whole case against them. This was completely a political maneuver to try and derail him, to keep him locked away in courtroom time. And Trump bought it. And Trump got to the point where he did something that usually they don't allow people to do unless they're like another lawyer or something. But he came and he spoke at the end of this whole thing. And they gave him a list of what he couldn't say that I've heard was over 200 pages long. So he couldn't say so many things. This has never been done to somebody who was an advocate in this potential role before. But this judge had had it with Trump because Trump was going outside the courtroom instantly and telling the media how uh, corrupt the court was, the judge was, other people were. Now, we don't have time to go on a deep dive in this judge, but this judge is should not be a judge. He is a tool of uh, the Democrat Party, and he has done terrible things when it comes to criminal justice. He's done terrible things in his career. If you look up his career, this is not an esteemed judge. This is one of those judges in New York that you wonder, how is he still there? It's like a, a terrible movie judge. This isn't like a, and I'm sorry to say that, but it, like when you investigate what he's done in his lifetime, he's anti-Christian, he's anti a lot of human rights, he's, he's really easy on criminals, but then he's going after someone like Trump this way. So let's watch this clip from Roman. I think Roman's done such a great job of just filtering this well. President Trump's trial in New York really came to a head this week as the presiding judge wrote an all caps email to Trump's lawyers. All caps means yelling or being demanding. Warning them that if Trump wants to speak in the case, he better not mention the attorney general or he will be kicked out of the courtroom altogether. After about 11 full weeks, this trial reached its final stretch. And as the trial was making its way to the end, the question became whether President Trump would be allowed to address the courtroom as a part of his closing remarks, something that is generally, typically very common in a civil trial like this. However, what is normally a total non-issue became a real sticking point in this case. That's because according to these emails right here that were made public, the judge overseeing the case demanded that President Trump must adhere to a strict set of ambiguous rules if you were to allow to address the court. I would say from what I've researched and what I've read about and the lawyer I talked to, it's not as common as what Roman was saying, but I agree with everything else he's saying here. It's not very common that the person the case is against, they might give a closing statement, but not necessarily like he wanted 15 minutes and it got whittled down to five minutes. Specifically in an email dated January 5th, here is what Judge Arthur Engren sent to the lawyers representing President Trump. Quote, I will consent to let Mr. Trump make a closing argument if, and only if, through counsel by January 9th of 2024, and by himself personally on the record just before he speaks, he agrees to limit his subjects to what is permissible in a counsel's closing argument, that is, commentary on the relevant material facts that are in evidence and application of the relevant law to those facts. Yeah, he, he goes through this. I'm gonna just kind of fast forward to this to the part where Trump actually speaks. And Trump took those five minutes to, among other things, tell the court that the state should actually be paying him damages rather than the other way around. Quote, Your Honor, the financial statements were perfect. The banks got all their money back. The banks are happy as can be. I spoke to an executive at Zurich Bank. They said, you didn't defraud us. There wasn't one witness against us. This entire case is a political witch hunt, and I should be the one receiving damages for what they've taken this company through. We have millions of pages of documents. They have nothing. I'm an innocent man. I've been persecuted by somebody running for office. The legal scholars talking about this case, they find it disgraceful. What's happened here, sir, is a fraud on me. And you know what happens? Companies leave. Without all that, Your Honor, all these days and months and years and millions and millions of pages, they found nothing. And now they come in and she says, I want a 250 million fine, now a $370 million fine. Your Honor, I did nothing wrong. They should pay me for what I've had to go through. I so agree with this because 
again, like uh, the lawyers I've talked to who aren't even for Trump are like, there's just no case. They have no witnesses. They just decided that he, what he did was wrong. Even there's no bank that would substantiate that. There's no one he invested with that was is crying. This man's wrong. It was people outside of the business deals who were saying this was wrong. But it's the same practice that if you take the top 25 billionaires in New York are still doing and no one's going after them because they're not running for office. That's the deal is that no one's running for office. And we're seeing that there's a very specific rule set given to Donald Trump. Now, the reason why I'm fighting so hard on this one this week is because you have a man who's trying to run for president. We should let him run for president. He has been found not guilty or in any of the criminal cases. And some of the other cases, he's been uh, penalized or, or given fines or whatever for things that may or may not have happened. And we've seen that with different cases along the way, like Gene from New York, who said he uh, had sexually abused her, but there was never proof. It was just, he said, she said, and he was uh, made to pay something based on that, which is really da bad precedence. Now, again, I am, I'm a fighter for, uh, I'm an advocate for those who've been abused for victims. I, I want victims to be made right. I want there to be solutions. I want to see human trafficking in, but when it comes to it, there has to be proof. There has to, the burden of proof has to be there. And that's why we live in America where you're innocent until proven guilty. You're not just guilty and you have to pay a fine because someone feels like you're guilty. You have to be innocent until proven guilty. And the burden of proof is not met so far in any of these cases at all. And so because of that, it makes me look at the whole thing as a Christian with discernment saying, what's happening in our country in America where the nations are laughing at us right now. It's crazy. I mean, Russia the, in their propaganda news is saying like, look how corrupt America is. They're going after Donald Trump. They're going, they won't prosecute Hunter Biden because Biden's like a dictator. Uh, Trump, they're trying to put him in jail because he's like a dictator there, you know, and it's all the other nations that are against us right now or are upset with us right now or have a bone to pick with us, socialism or whatever. They're making a mockery over us because we're mockable because we're doing these shenanigans. And most of it's coming from the progressive left where they're putting labels on everything they disagree with. And instead of us being on an even playing field politically, where it's just a candidate against a candidate and us saying, let's bring our policies, let's tell what we don't like about each other. Instead of it just being a normal election, it's become a lawfare election. It's become where everybody is evil and on whatever side you're, you're against, they're evil and demonic and villainized. But we do have to look, go back and look at some of these cases and go, this is demonic. There is some warfare in this against the Trump and the Trump administration from even being able to run. And that, my friends, makes me look at it very differently. And I look at it and go, okay, what's going on here? And if we came to the election day and it was like tomorrow and this is what was happening and Trump and Biden were the ones who you had to choose between, I'm telling you, don't not choose. Choose between one of them and choose with your Bible open and you begin to pray because we have to get somebody in office who can deal with the mess that's there right now. I don't personally think it's Biden. I'm not trying to tell you how to vote, but I think that there's something to be seen in what's going on with Trump right now that I'm going to keep looking at and looking at. And unless someone else gets raised up, I mean, there's a way better candidate that I I mean, I think of DeSantis, that I have more higher values alongside or Vivek. I think of some of these guys who have already dropped out. And I'm just like, man, even RFK, man, there's some things that he aligns with in the middle ground values that he talks about that are so interesting to me. But today, if it was Donald J. Trump or President Biden, you got to have your thinking hat on because to not vote is actually a spiritual act as well. It's passivity and passivity is such a thief and it will steal from you and it will steal from our nation. So I wanted to make this video to just like look at what's going on right now with Donald J. Trump and with President Biden and appeal to you to pray, pray with new eyes. Maybe you've been against one or both of them, but let's pray with new eyes. What are we supposed to do if those are our candidates? We better figure it out. Hello class, welcome to hell. Chuck here sounds like fingernails. <laughs> Your racers sound like Nickelback. But you know what's even worse? This high quality TV series about Jesus called The Chosen. Today's lecture, how do we discredit it? How do we shut it down? And most of all, how do we stop watching it? <laughs> I know, right? Know the trick. <gasps> There's something below hell? Well, I get to talk to you guys about some things that have been happening on The Chosen. I love this show so much. Now, some of you haven't connected to it like some of us have. There's people who are ultra fans and there's people who are like, oh, this has been good. I've learned some about this artistic representation of Jesus and the Gospels. And then some of you all haven't even connected to it or don't care about it. But what's been interesting is a lot of the actors that are on this have been in just the mainstream they're in SAG-AFTRA and they got hired by Dallas or others or the casting directors like my friend Jack Kelly or other, they hired them to be on the show. 
And one of them is Nick Shakur. Now, Nick is the father of James and John, so he plays Zebedee on the show. Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> We've just been called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> Go cool. no. And he has had some encounters of the last year on the show and then off the show where he's really gone after the Holy Spirit in a way that he never has before. He actually got baptized in the Spirit. That means that he's actually like a charismatic believer now. And he not only plays Zebedee, but he's not a father in real life, but he's come into some level of fathering through this role. And I wanted to play this one encounter where he shares it so well with CBN. And I just thought it'd be a great thing for us to go through together just to see what God's doing on behind the scenes on a mainstream, you know, TV show. That's one of the biggest shows in our generation right now and how God's moving on it. Here's a clip. Let's watch it together. Thank you so much for chatting with me. And how has this role playing Zebedee, the father of James and John, two disciples of Jesus, how has that affected you personally? It gave me insight that I never thought I'd have into what it's like to be a dad. I'm not a dad in real life, but when I, when I stepped into the role and I've told people it was, he was downloaded to me from God. Like it was a literal download when I got the script. I didn't do script analysis. I, I, actually, I was careless in the audition and I, I thought I bombed it. And, uh, and playing him has given me a strong taste of what it's like to step into the shoes of a loving father. I love how when you're acting or when you're in the entertainment industry, a lot of times you become more, you get expanded by playing different roles. And especially as Christians, there's so many Christians who've told me when they've acted in different movies or TV shows, how they became more of who they're supposed to be because they got to touch this character, this art, this person, this empathy and compassion for somebody that they're not like, whether they're playing a villain or whether they're playing a cop or whether they're playing a mom and they're not a mom yet. And this man for you know being a dad. I give all credence and credit to God because I don't know what it's like. So how am I playing that so well? if it isn't him inspiring me to do that. And he's such a vibe doing it. I love when he plays the father. He's just such a good father in the show. Okay, so talk about your faith. I mean, has your faith really grown as you've been a part of The Chosen? When I was younger, my grandfather was a Greek priest, so I grew up Greek Orthodox. But as life does, it takes you through a series of challenges and trials, and it causes your heart to start to turn into a rock, and you start to experience an inner battle. When I first signed up to do The Chosen, I had a conversation with God and told him, you probably don't even exist because of where I was at. And something in me opened up. It was like a black hole started to open up and swallow me alive. And I heard my heart call out, say, if you don't call out to God right now, this is about to get really bad. And I'm, I'm invited to this conference by two of our uh, construction blueprint designers, uh, Seth and Brandon. And I thought, well, what is it? And they're like, you know, it's, we get together, we pray. And I'm like, Okay, and my heart said, you should go. And so I went, I walk in and I'm like, okay, people are twirling around like ballerinas and swing <laughs> side to side. This is so weird. Oh, man. And I was kind of jaded at that point. So that's how I was seeing all of it. Before it goes, I just want to tell you, if you're praying for somebody in the entertainment industry right now, think about the people that are there that you're most connected to or that, that have meant the most to you, maybe the roles are in. And most people have a faith background or have been touched by faith people at some point. And a lot of Christians are inviting their friends in the industry to church meetings and to conferences and to events. Keep praying because God's using those prayers to empower. Like I said, my heart said you should go. It's the Holy Spirit who told him to go in his heart. And I feel like God's doing that right now in a big way. So just keep praying, but let's keep going on the story. I was like, okay, we're an hour in. I'm going to put my head down and I'm going to pray. And I started in my heart asking God to remove this burden that was, I feel, transferred to me from my family because of the war torn country that we're from mm. in Beirut, Lebanon. And so I said, Lord, whatever this is I'm carrying, I want it off of me. 20 minutes doesn't even go by. Uh, my buddy Seth, who invited me, his son comes over behind me from like 40 feet away, taps me on the shoulder and says, um, I want you to know I was praying for you from back there. And God told me to tell you that <laughs> it's crazy. By by showing up tonight, you broke your family's generational curse. <laughs> wow. 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 Wait, I'm just stopping. For those of you who don't know, I just stopped and looked at the camera. For those of you who are listening on podcast, this is awesome. And that was the first kind of like peg that knocked me off my my balance and I lost it. I was like, of all the things you could have told me, what? And then later on the pastor she got up on stage and said, okay, I want everybody to get on their knees and, and bury their idols. And I stood there and I was like, I don't have any idols. 
And then the heart came in and this voice came through really strongly this time and said, yeah, you do actually, uh, your acting career, your voiceover, your mom, your dad, your brother-in-law, your sisters, wow. your sister, your other sister's boyfriend, uh, your bank accounts, oh, your Jeep commander, your car, da -da 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 -da, and you've, you've put them all before me. And I was like, ouch, that really hurt. I got on my knee. For the first time in my life, I genuinely gave them all to God, as wow. in this is my offering to you, because I've been on this show, I've been hearing about you, I've been hearing about these parables, and I just want to be with you now. So I gave him everything. <laughs> it um, amalgamated into nine people placing their hands on me, kind of ganging up on me, and uh, they're one of their elders coming up with anointing oil, like the irony. Now remember, again, this is a man who wasn't even a Christian playing Zebedee on a show that has this faith base or faith adjacent, you know, because it's the interpretation show. And he he's going for it right here. He's giving his life to Jesus at an event from two of the guys who were on the cast or on the set of the show. And then he's getting prayed for and getting anointed. Anointing my forehead, my palms. Next thing I know, he was praying over me in tongues. And from from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, it was like fire was passing through and burning everything that I had in me away to where I was gonna ask them to call 911. It was like, whoa, I'm getting dizzy, what's going on? And it was frightening. It wasn't like, oh, it felt good. And it was, no, it was, Wow. I felt God's presence and it was frightening. So wow. I, I understood what it meant, oh, the fear of the Lord. Yes. It was like, oh, yeah. he could kill me at any second like this if he wanted to, he could just evaporate me. And it got to a point where I felt like I was being microwaved and vibrated at the same time. And then eventually just dipped into water before my body could handle any, couldn't handle any more burning. I felt wow. like my skin was gonna explode off my body. Wow. And then I was submerged in an ocean and then all the prayers went very muffled. And then all of a sudden I was just pulled up, it felt. And then everything was just still. And it felt so weird because I didn't feel like myself anymore. And since then, it's been one encounter after the next. And it went from, oh, I have faith to, I don't have faith anymore. I don't need it. Cause like I met him <laughs> and I jokingly say yes. like, I know the guy, Come like on. I know him. I mean, this is huge. Cause I think of him and so many people on the chosen who it wasn't because of Dallas, the director and writer. It wasn't because of Jonathan, who's, you know, playing Jesus. All these different people are having encounters with God that are linked to the show. It's like you can't tell the story of Jesus without Jesus showing up in your personal life. And they're they're just having these moments. I'm not saying everyone who's involved is a believer or faith-based, but so many beautiful stories are coming out of this. And I just think it's so powerful how God wants to use the greatest stories ever told to win over people who are just they're just normal actors in the industry. They're just pursuing the industry. It's a hard industry to pursue. And yet they get placed in these shows, and we hear this a lot they get placed in these kinds of shows or around a faith-based group and it changes everything he had such a genuine encounter with jesus and he's unashamed to share this he's sharing this in a christian network cbn who we work with it's so beautiful and i want you guys again be praying for hollywood be praying for god wants to do and this is so important before we go into our last story because our last story is about how a lot of people in the entertainment industry are blaspheming the holy spirit blaspheming jesus but right now there's so there's such a move of god in the entertainment industry and we need to believe for all that god wants to do and i want to encourage you some of you like when he used that language of like god spoke to him and his heart led him some of you haven't experienced that yet but i'm going to encourage you to join our spiritual growth academy online you can go to our spiritual growth academy and just go to one class every week or you can go to one of the back classes that aren't live that are just pre-recorded so you can do them whenever you want to or i actually get to mentor you once a month and hearing god's voice we have so many great classes and things like dream interpretation the gifts of the holy spirit hearing god's voice and i'm in a class right now about the nonverbal, unspoken ways that god speaks to us in other words he he's given us a gift to visually see images or pictures or visions or we feel things or we know things in our knower and we're breaking this down and helping it to be useful so it changes your everyday life. Blasphemer! 
Okay, I had to respond. Little Nas X has been going through his Christian phase, and we find out it's not a Christian phase at all. He's just using Christ imagery in a blasphemous way for his performance, and he has a reason why he said he did. We're going to go through his apology video for just a minute, but before we do that, I want to watch what Lecrae said, because I think Lecrae did such a great job. Lecrae's been been a voice of reason for a lot of entertainment stuff that's happened out there. I don't know if you follow him at all, but he's just, he was a Grammy award winning musician, but he's also a deep thinker and he's, he went through a period, we just did a video about him not too long ago, you go back and watch it, where he deconstructed his faith, but then reconstructed and actually has this authenticity to his relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to play his video and I'm going to talk to you about it as we play it. Father, scratch my head. Angels, he says, as he runs around in a denim skirt. Little Nas X is a gimmick rapper. Stupid Christians falling for the same old stupid mess. Little Nas X, or you ain't a Christian. You an abomination using the title of a Christian for club. Where do we begin? So he makes this Christian kind of video where he's acting like he's worshiping, but it's not really, really a worship song. It's really narcissistic. It's very self-centered, but it sounds like it could be towards Christ. And Christians do get it really excited. We're like. Oh my gosh, another Christian celebrity. But this was not like the potential of Kanye West actually trying to really convert, but starting with bipolar. This is a guy who's using Christian imagery, Christian songs, and trying to get reaction, really trolling the Christian community and trying to get attention. I mean, that's who Little Nas X is. He means lap dancing on Satan and then going for Jesus. It's just so bad. I have had a few interactions with Little Nas X. Um, when we spoke last, I remember him saying his dad was a big fan, which made me feel old, if anything. Uh, <laughs> but it was still cool to know, you know, he's encountered um, the music. I, I don't know for certain, but what I've heard is that his dad is a pretty devout, a devout Christian. And... I can only imagine what his experience has been um, being an outright uh, gay man growing up in a religious environment. I wonder if he has any frustrations or presuppositions or ideas about how Christians act toward him because potentially maybe he wasn't treated well historically. Yeah. Um, and that, that's not a secret. The Christian community does not treat the gay community well, has not historically, right? That's just not, you know, anything to hide. Um, and that's because there are varying degrees of perspectives and objectives as it pertains to Christians engaging culture. Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting in this season of time when I think Luke Ray's argument, I would encourage you to watch this whole video on this. If you're interested in what's happening with little Nas X, because I think he breaks some things down, but the one part that he did was, was a little bit in his defense and it wasn't really defending anything, but it was just saying, well, he's probably been spiritually abused. I'm from a religious family. And then he came out as not only gay, but extremely gay and flamboyant and possibly somewhat transgender. We don't know, or at least likes drag for sure. That's a keen and brilliant observation, sir. And he came out with all these things and he became very successful. He has this huge following. He has a huge following amongst young black men who aren't gay. Then he has a huge following just across the homosexual LGBTQ plus community. Then he has a young following of just mainstream people. And it's just really interesting who's following Little Nas X right now. And like Craig was just reacting, like saying, well, there's probably something inside of him that's kind of in pain and then reacting in that pain to project these images or to try and quantify or at least dismantle or dismiss what happened to him from some religious abuse. So I thought that was a, a good perspective just to give empathy because we do want to have empathy for Little Nas X. I'm not, I'm not anti him. I'm anti his career. I think his career is absolutely corrupt. And I think what he does, these shenanigans are bad, but he's gifted. I mean, he's really gifted and he's really talented. Unfortunately, the talent's so tainted by his shenanigans that it just isn't helpful at all. But I'm going to, uh, I'm going to play Ben Shapiro. Now Ben Shapiro is never going to be in alignment with anything 
uh, a little Nas X. And he's probably not the best person to be talking about this, but I, I liked his response and I thought it was funny. There is a new video out, a new music video from one of our favorite artists here at The Daily Wire, Lil Nas X. That was the name he came out of his mother with. She she looked at him and she said, I shall call him <laughs> Lil Nas X. Now he has a new song called Jay Christ. Uh, uh, James? John? Who knows? Could be any Christ. Anyway, here is some of this silly video. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Again, I was laughing at this because remember, Ben Shapiro is Christ adjacent. He's not a Christian. He's Jewish, but he really understands the biblical process, both in the Old and New Testament. And so he knows this is blasphemy. He also knows that when Little Nas X was acting like he was a Christian, but then he comes out with this song on Friday. It was not about Christ at all. It was about Little Nas X recreating himself again for another iteration. He went from his satanic phase, then he goes to his Christian phase, but it's not really Christian at all. And it's probably not real Satanism either, but it is very Satan serving in the midst of what it is. He's not playing the video, just so you know if you're listening. We're not really watching the video. We're watching Ben Spear watch the video. If you want to watch the video, if you go online or something, I don't recommend it. It's a lot of weird from heaven to hell, Satan, Jesus, he's Jesus in the video, but he's very feminine. He's in drag a couple times. He's like dancing with the spirit squad, which might be angels. It's bizarre. What is even, man, has there ever been anyone as desperate for attention as this human? Up oh, now here is Jesus. Yeah, I got to go the whole way. What is this? This is like a horrific LSD dream. <laughs> Why is this so long? I feel like I've been here for it three really years long. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So I'm not a Christian, but my assumption was that when you became a Christian, something has to change about you. <laughs> what changed? Can anyone detect the change? No. In fact, he's the exact same person. He's just now getting even more blasphemous in the imagery that he uses. I hate to break it to Lil Nas X, but actually, yes, Christianity does make moral demands of you. I know. Crazy. Yeah, I think I liked him best in Old Town Road, which is saying a lot. You know, it's just one of those moments in time where an artist took Christianity and used it in a blasphemous way more than anybody ever has before. We've had Madonna, we've had Sam Smith, we've had Miley Cyrus, we've had so many people use Christianity to boost their, uh, boost their career or bolster their career, or to kind of, they're rebelling against the religious institution and they're using blasphemy to show how artistic and creative they've become and how much they've risen above these religious thoughts. And we'll probably do a video on that very soon because I think there's so much that's happened in a compiled way over the last couple of years. And I think it's good to talk about, but Little Nas got so, X got so much pushback. I was surprised that he responded because normally when he's responded, he's like, y'all just crazy. Y'all just, you know, homo gay hating people. Like I've watched him say these videos over and over, but this time he tried to be authentic. And I thought he was genuinely trying to apologize. Now I realized though, he doesn't know why he's apologizing because he doesn't know why he offended anybody because he doesn't understand sanctity. He doesn't understand holiness. He doesn't understand who God is. He doesn't understand who Jesus is. And so here he is apologizing. So first of all, when I did the artwork, I knew like there would be some upset people or whatnot. When I did the artwork, so he's really trying to say, hey, this isn't messaging, this is just art. Simply because, you know, religion is a very sensitive topic for a lot of people. But I also didn't mean to like mock, this wasn't like a F you to you people, um, F you to the Christians. Like, you know, it wasn't, it was not that. It was literally me saying, oh, I'm back. I'm back like Jesus. You can't take the Quran, you can't take the Bible, you can't take the Book of Mormon and prostitute it for your own benefit to make yourself look good. Hey, I, I'm artistically re-representing that I am Buddha and I am reincarnated and I'm using that imagery to make myself awesome, even though it discounts your very genuine beliefs and, and takes the sanctity away of those things and runs over it for my, for my 10 minutes of fame and feel like no one's going to respond, especially Christianity, which has been so subjected to hate lately. There's been so much against Christianity and nations. People are dying right now because they're Christians all over the world. There's been more martyrdom in the last couple of years. And we have to look at that. I mean, in Nigeria, all over Africa, period, in the Middle East, there's been so much martyrdom because people love Jesus. And then he's taking that and dumbing it down to what he's calling art. And it's just not art. And he doesn't understand still. So he's saying, I kind of apologize. I kind of don't apologize. I mean, you know, forgive me, but not really. And I will say though, with the communion video, 
with me eating the crackers and juice. I uh, I thought that video was gonna be the video to lighten the mood, to take it down like less serious or whatnot. I thought that was something that we all wanted to do as kids or whatnot, but I didn't understand the idea of, um, you know, the reality of what it is. You know, it's me eating the commune, which is like the symbolism of like Jesus's blood and, and bones or something like that. I don't remember com completely. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you using imagery for your own sake that you don't even understand and using it so flippantly? Again, this speaks of a level of arrogance and a level, uh, and I like that he's trying to understand. I like that he's saying, I don't really understand. I think it means this. I'm like, I didn't mean to use communion that way. And I get when we're little kids, it's true. We all want to eat all the communion. We all want to drink all the juice. My daughters try and take two or three extra communion little cups because we have the cheesy little ones, you know, church. And they want to take those and 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 we teach them though these are not just something you eat and play with these are things that we're really going to explain to you because this is sanctity to our family and to our belief system of taking on the nature of jesus and becoming new creations but under jesus we're surrendering ourselves and our agenda for his this isn't that this isn't even just normal art this is narcissism and again he's young enough to where he's making a very stupid mistake that's probably going to cost him all through his career from being around really good people who could help him but because he's not really taking responsibility it's just kind of like well we all want to do this i mean i feel bad but not really like i mean so too bad so sad but um i did not mean it to as like a cannibalism thing or whatever the freak but i do apologize for that sort of he sort of apologizes and sort of sort of not and i just i think it's a really it's a shameful thing what happened and i think you know and he, I, i'm glad that he made an apology video i really am but i am looking at christianity right now is under attack in the world all religions are under attack all the time it's just what it is but christianity jesus who he is it's it's the number one cuss word jesus christ people say it as a cuss word all the time people use Christian imagery and I would watch it with Balenciaga. We've watched it with so many different organizations, like major fashion houses, you know, coming out on fashion week with people, cruci models crucified for the sake of the fashion coming forward. Like people use this artistic representation because the church has become something to them that they can make fun of. They can prostitute, they can take these themes and they feel like there's no ramifications for it. But to the, you know, the, the 2.7 billion Christians on the earth, it's wrong and it's, it's hurtful and it's spiteful and it's mean. It's like, you know, some people get upset because maybe someone doesn't understand somebody who's transgender or LGBTQ plus, or even maybe someone who's handicapped and they just are like, you're, you're not, you're not being sensitive to them yet. Christianity has never fought for, for people to be sensitive to. I remember, you know, last year or it might've been the year before when, um, Dwight from, the office was saying people are so mean to Christians. They always put Christians as the villain, like especially in Hollywood, the villain of every story. It's a sub villain of every story. And he was recognizing the fact that Christians have such a bad rap that, and they're, they're so, they're, there's so many hurtful things towards them. There's no sensitivity towards them. And yes, there's been religious abuse. And so you could just say, you can blame it all on that, but you're not looking at the average kid in Sunday school who really loves Jesus and loves their faith and is saying like, I just want a normal experience. And yet I, Find out that little Nas X is taking the thing that's the most precious to me, Jesus, and defiling him. And like, I don't know how to reconcile that with the music I listen to and the people I'm around who love this and what I feel and how it hurts me because there's no sensitivity to it. There's no sensitivity to somebody who loves God. And this is such a, such a terrible thing. And it's such an affliction towards Christianity right now. And where, you know, Christians are the, the villains of every story. It's true. They're, they're the villains of culture right now because we have different standards or belief system that isn't necessarily compatible in all the cultural sensitive areas, yet we're not getting applied the same sensitivity to us because we're different. And so I think it's really important. This is a important conversation we're having because blasphemy is not going away. If Little Nas X is doing it, it's, there's some increases that's going to happen in companies around you. And we need to not just go, oh, it's just, it's just an entertainment thing. We need to say, this is wrong and hold them accountable. Thank God people are holding him accountable and saying, this is wrong. And he's like, oh, it's not a religion, man. It's just art. It is more than religion and art. And I hope we learn something from this. And I hope we can learn something from this. Well, 2024 has been quite a year already. We've already had a number of hardships that have happened around the world. We've had natural disasters. We've had more polarization, more lawsuits, more states dropping 
Uh, there are different contenders for the presidential race based on different lawsuits, whether it be Biden is being dropped from certain states or Trump being dropped from certain states from their ballots because of the illegal activities they might be involved with. It has been wild so far just watching. We even had some alien touchdown potentially in Miami. We don't know if it's true or not. That is definitely not true. I don't know. I don't think it's true. But you know, these kinds of sensational stories have been plaguing our mainstream news media and also even in social media commentators and news. But in the midst of this, God is doing so much and he wants to set up your 2024 for your heart to thrive and for his passion for your life and for your calling to actually move forward. God always has a provision for your calling. He always has a purpose for your calling. And I'm going to give you three keys. Just take the keys and go. Of things that he's shown me that are going to help you to succeed in 2024. And I'm going to start this out reading the scripture. And I'm reading it out of the Passion Translation. It's Proverbs 24, 2024. The Lord is the one who directs your life. For each step you take is ordained by God to bring you close to your destiny. So much of your life then remains a mystery. And I love that because God is directing us when we surrender our life to Jesus. He's directing you right now. And as he's directing you, many of the things he's directing you into, they remain a mystery as you walk into faith. That's It requires faith to walk with God. And so you have to be comfortable with the fact that you don't know always the end from the beginning. Many of us want to quantify everything and have an answer for everything and understand the five-year plan or the seven-year model that we're going to live life out of set goals until the time we die. And the problem with walking in faith is that you can't always do those things. And so there is some instability that comes when you're not walking in faith and there's a lot of mystery around you. Maybe he's has you in a transition or he's asked you and led you into something that you don't understand how to fully say yes to because you don't know what's on the other side. And those are the moments that are make it or break it for Christians to say, I trust you, though I don't understand where you're leading me and I'm going to follow you anyway. So the first key. Okay, let's see. Here. Let's see. Of what God wants to do this year is he wants to reward your obedience. Many of you have been obedient in 22, 23, and now it's 2024, and he wants to reward the obedience and reveal some of that mystery. It's the Lord who's been directing your step. He wants to show you what you're walking into. He wants to give you some more, not just clues, but he wants to anchor your hope. And some of the areas that you've walked out and said yes to are going to start to manifest into the opportunity that you were believing you were saying yes to God for. And so you're going to start to see maybe things that were delayed or things that didn't happen in 2020, 2021, 2022, but now it's 2024 and God's saying, or God's releasing vision, but he's also releasing a culmination in some of these areas of faith that you've pressed into. And so as many of you who've been in that season of surrender, you said, God, lead me, I'll go where you want me to go. And then you became somewhat blind or life became somewhat mysterious, or maybe he took a bunch of things and stripped a lot of things away, but he hasn't given a lot of things back yet. You're going to start to see the move and the actions of God where you're going to say, wow, I could have never got here if I hadn't have surrendered my agenda and my life and my career and my family and my place I live and my, you know, the, the place I go to church, all these things. If I never surrendered those to God, I would have never have gotten here. And so the first key and the first thing that I really think that God wants you to focus on this year is to look at the areas that have been mysterious and, and expect answers, expect that God's going to show you something in those areas. The second thing I want to talk about is favor. God is going to reward his people who've been walking out of faith with unusual favor. You're going to get opportunities and favor and even signs of favor that's to come. It's not just favor for this year, but he's going to start a momentum or a cycle of favor in your life to give you uh, opportunities, relationships, connections, and even the provisional resources you need to get the job done that he's put on your life, to get the calling done. And when I say that, it's not just to do the mission, you know, in the world to, to do a ministry or to start a business, but it's also for your family. So God wants to give you favor for the opportunities your family has for your marriage. And many of you have maybe been in a season of regearing life, regrouping, and maybe making some tangible plans to prioritize marriage, family, or if you're single, to prioritize how you're going to spend your life, your, your time outside of your career. And maybe you're even spending time reprioritizing how you're going to do your career, how you're going to do your job, how you're going to do your mission. And God is looking at those plans and he's looking at how you're trying to bring balance and boundaries to your life. And he's going to bless that with his favor. And so many of you who used to have to work a lot harder to get results that you're getting maybe in marriage or in relationships or maybe out of the ministry or the business or the career you're doing, you're going to actually be able to work smarter because God's going to give you wisdom and strategy instead of harder, which means you have to apply more effort. So God's going to bring favor even over your life. And I feel like God's going to bring favor signs to many people who are watching. So favor signs is when God gives you bonuses or he gives you benefits. All of a sudden you get to a restaurant, someone pays for your meal or they give you something free there, or you get into 
a deal, a negotiation for a new car or something that's happening in your job. And all of a sudden you get a favorable alternative that nobody else gets. It's a, this is the best deal we've ever given, or this is the the best raise. I, I, this is beyond what I was going to give you in this season. You're going to see a benefit of God's favor. And he wants you to feel that because being a son or a daughter of God comes with favor and it comes with your allying or allying yourself to the kingdom of God. And that alliance brings, even though there's a great sacrifice in saying, I'm not going to do things my way or just the normal human way. I'm going to align my faith to you, God. There's a great reward in that sacrifice to where God comes through in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And I think of my wife and I, some of the projects that we've worked on and, you know, we surrender our agenda and our goals to God for uh, for even the good goals, even the things that he's already moving on. And we're saying, but God, you can have this too. And about a year and a half ago, and we've told this story in different ways, but we felt like God was saying, put everything on the table of surrender, your car, your, or your cars, your house, your, where you live, your church, your kid's school, the way you do your career, the way you're doing, you know, your life, how all these things. And I saw them as like anchors and said, like basically unanchor everything from what it's anchored in and anchor all your faith to me. And I thought of it more like an Isaac Abraham experience where we were going to just, you know, put things on the altar. He gives it back and he provides the lamb of sacrifice type thing. But he actually was pushing us into a transition we wouldn't have made if he didn't ask us to be obedient. And so during that time, we went into a time of mystery where we were saying the Lord's directing our life. We're not really sure. And we couldn't, can't quantify why we're even like we put our house up for sale and we sold our house. We did all these things. And then God led us towards the end of last year, after about a year and a half, he led us into a bunch where he revealed the mystery, a bunch of opportunities in media, both of us in media, and then also personally for our lives that we, and I'll tell you more about that, especially those of you who are partners of our ministry or people who get our newsletter, I'll tell you some of the transitions we're going through because they're really exciting, but we both got uh, offered shows and media projects and things that we wouldn't have got without being obedient to God. And there's favor in the obedience, there's favor in the sacrifice. So many of you who've been in a season of sacrifice of saying, God, maybe it's even being like, maybe you're unmarried and you're saying, I'm not gonna go through the normal process. I'm not gonna go through a ton of dating apps and there's nothing wrong with dating apps, but I'm gonna go, I'm gonna give you my process, God, and look for a God result. God is gonna reward that obedience. God's gonna reward the obedience of you who are pastors who've been out there who are saying, I'm not gonna do what every other pastor does to make their church successful. I'm not gonna do the secret friendly program that everyone else feels like works for them, but I'm gonna do something where I'm gonna really hold the line for what God wants to do for evangelism or for a move of his presence or for church growth in our, in our community. And I just think God's going to really honor that. You're going to see his favor, bless that. You're going to see the God who's been mysterious, all of a sudden reveal unusual opportunities that again, it'll be above what you could have produced in your own abilities or with the current talent set and the talent pool around you. You're going to see God come through. Those of you who are business people, it's the same. You're going to see God come through in such a profound way. And I think that you need to hear that for 2024, that many of you are going to see the reward of favor and you're going to see God blessing you with unusual favor. And when it happens, say, oh, this is what Sean was prophesying. This is favor of God and it's going to multiply. So make sure when it happens, even a little bit, Maybe you get more in your tax return than you, were, than you were expecting. Favor of God. Favor. Make even hashtag right now. If you're seeing it, hashtag favor. Because hashtag favor means I'm recognizing the favor and expecting it to multiply. And this is huge. This is huge. The third thing that God wants to do is he wants to bring some emotionally rooted health, biblically and spiritually, that maybe the a mental and emotional health has been a struggle, maybe anxiety or fear. And some of this could be really long term, but you're going to watch God bring you into processes that begin to alleviate anxiety, fear, and panic out of your life. God's going to come in and bring to you. If you'll, if you'll allow the intentional process of God, if you'll be obedient when it comes, maybe it's through a therapist or maybe it's through some inner healing, or maybe it's through uh, even a biblical plan of how to read the Bible right now, because the Bible actually brings a lot of mental stability and it brings a lot of emotional stability. It actually helps you to make choices quicker. Kind of like if you're in intentional counseling, you're making choices that help to root you differently in your mental and emotional well-being. Well, reading the Bible also does that, especially when you read some Psalms and some Proverbs and you do life application and you do some study around those, even why those were written when they were written. But God is going to bring some emotional and mental stability and anchors. And this is huge because not only is he going to do it individual on a small micro level, but God's going to bring some tools in 2024 and beyond 
that we've never had before in humanity to help the anxiety that's in culture to decrease. And I think of this like when Brene Brown, uh, who's a sociologist who defined what vulnerability looks like because she was realizing there was a breakdown in connectivity where humans weren't feeling connected to themselves or the world around them. And she started to do some massive research and studying to this and realized through that, that she had had a breakdown in her life and that she didn't feel connected. And that the reason why is because she couldn't be vulnerable. And this message of vulnerability because of how it was promoted on Netflix and through Oprah and through churches and through leadership teams around the Fortune 500 companies, through all these retreats that happened, it actually moved the needle when it came to the lack of connection and actually began a conversation to solve some of that. Now it's not all solved and it, and it only moves the needle a little bit, but it helped. And if you haven't watched that, it's such a powerful tool. Well, I feel like God's gonna raise up some tools like a Brene Brown type tool that happened then that are very creative to help the issue of anxiety in society. And maybe you're struggling with anxiety and worry and, and, and you have to realize that part of the biblical truth that Jesus started out his ministry with was do not worry. And the Bible says, do not be afraid. So the fact that we have the, an, uh, an epidemic of anxiety, you have to realize there's a father in heaven, just like natural parents when your children are going through anxiety, you stop and you do caregiving and you care for them and you help them and you do everything you can in your power to alleviate as much of the anxiety as you can. The father in heaven is looking at the earth right now for his children and saying, cast your cares upon me. Let me teach you how to do that. And he's going to provide some models. And we're going to see some things form both inside and outside the church that are going to help us to process anxiety. And for Christians, we're going to learn how to cast our cares on God in even deeper ways. Because since the pandemic, we've seen even in the church an all-time epidemic of anxiety. And God is going to help us with mental and emotional health. And we're going to see some tools amongst Christianity. And some of them have been being formed. So they're already 20 and 30 years old. But they're going to start to get that favor on them. And they're going to start to get those tools are going to be uh, deployed. And so we're going to see deployment amongst Christian psychologists and psychiatrists and, and book books that are not just self-help, but are books that can actually, I'll use the word anchor again, anchor us into mental and emotional stability that will be from the foundational faith of who Jesus is, but also will be healthy living and healthy uh, mindsets and healthy emotions. I just think it's going to be phenomenal. I heard this so clearly from God that he's going to help our our mental illness epidemic and our anxiety epidemic in the world, especially in America right now, but it's for the whole world. But I was focused on America when I was praying into this. I heard it so clearly that I cannot wait. Now I'm just like, I'm, I'm just, I can feel these tools are coming and I can't wait to see how creative God is to allow them to emerge because I feel some of it will come through entertainment, like some certain movies that'll be like a before and after moment for may, maybe mental health and then, uh, or emotional health. And I feel like there's going to be some popular book series or some popular books like the Brene Brown effect that happened. I feel like there's going to be some popular messages. Like, have you ever seen somebody who got raised up? Like I think of Joyce Myers, one of the first messages she gave that actually was a rallying point for mentoring and discipleship of our inner life to mentor us. She became a, a mothering voice to disciple our character. And there's going to be some of those kinds of tools, like a Joyce Myers type tool. It may not be Joyce Myers, but there's going to be someone like that. There's going to be key figures that got raises up with a message for this time that you're going to feel in your family. You're going to feel in your church staff. You're going to feel in your business. You're going to feel in your career that something is a before and after moment for how to process anxiety and fear and negative emotions. And God's going to help us. He's going to send great help for those who will grab hold of it and be intentional about it. It's going to be a before and after year for you with these, some of these struggles that you might've had before this, you didn't have language, you didn't have keys and tools to process. And then after this, we're going to see some of those tools. And again, it's not just this year, 2024, but this is the kind of grace that God's releasing, especially through his people to help. And we're going to start to see the mental uh, illness, the mental struggles and the anxiety struggles in the church, the emotional struggles in the church church, there's going to be some answers. And just like we've watched over the last 10 years, the divorce rate in Christianity has become much lower than the divorce rate of the world. There was a time it matched. But if you look at the current research, it's much lower by, you know, it used to be very close, like within 10 points of each other statistically. And now it's 20 points or more statistically. So we're watching the tools in the church, the healthy marriage tools that are out there that Christians can embrace and the, the focus and the narratives and the testimonies has changed a lot. We're going to watch that with other tools as well, where there will be a big gap between those who follow Christ and those who don't when it comes to mental health and well-being, because God is imparting, I mean, his spirit is a spirit that literally brings a sound mind. That's what 
Uh, Second Timothy says, Paul says to Timothy, hey, he's giving you a spirit that's a sound mind. And I just think that's so profound. It's so profound that he's given us that. And many of you are longing for that for a family member or even for yourself in an area. Maybe it's just one area that you constantly struggle with and you're going, God, can you help me? He is going to show you how to use the tools of the Bible, the tools that he's presenting around you. And there's not another generation who has had so many tools on the, their table, but we need the Lord to deploy them for us so that we really understand how to use them and overcome. One of the things that God calls us is overcomers to him who overcomes. Read the first couple chapters of the book of Revelation, the promises of those who overcome, because those aren't just promises that Jesus was speaking to John for the end times, although the end of the age, of course, it's for that. But it's also you can have an overcomer spirit now and enter into the blessings of overcoming in your generation. What are those blessings? Well, they're defined really clearly there. And you can take those very personally because that's what happens when you overcome the world and you overcome patterns of humanity that were part of the fall and you allow yourself to embrace the fullness of Jesus and the cross and the cross, uh, the resurrection side of the cross as well, where you allow yourself to become a new creation in Christ. He wants to disciple you and he wants to help you. And so I want, to, I want you to take this very seriously. If these are resonating with you, what I've been talking about today, make sure to hashtag my turn because it's your turn for God to do a great work in your life. Maybe it's for your family. Leave some family members in the comments that you want us to pray for, for favor or for, for the, those tools to be deployed in their life or for all the things I'm talking about today. And I just bless you for your 2024. I know that God's going to be doing so much this year. And look at this year, even if you're in a negative place or a hard place, this is a container of time, 2024, that God could do so much in you. And instead of focusing on all the negative that's happening in the world around you, or maybe in your own personal life, maybe you can't get unfocused from some of that negative. Make sure to look for God and what he's doing too. Make sure to stop that loop of negative cycles in your head and say, God, but what are you doing? What are you saying to me? What are you doing in my life? What are areas I can look at? Maybe in the past 12 months that you've already done some good things in my life, even if it feels so small compared to the bad, or it feels so small compared to the bigness of the problems of the world, focus on those things, whatever's pure, right, holy, noble, fix your mind and your affections on what God's doing. And as you do that, it'll cause your eyes to open for more. I know that I was looking at a research on people who are Christians who are generous and Christians have a propensity to believe in generosity is going to come towards them because they're the most generous people group on the earth right now because they, they're naturally taught to give. It's part of our tenets of our faith to be generous with our time and our service, our finances, our resources, to be hospitable, to be welcoming, to care about foreigners and aliens, to care about all these things. Well, because we're generous, one of the benefits of generosity that happens, if we're just, it wires you neuro, neurologically this way, but it's also your spirit is more receptive, is that you believe people will be generous back. And so therefore you have more generosity extended towards you. And I think that's true in these areas. When we look for God and how he's moving in our life and we celebrate those, those movements, whether it's, man, man, this relationship got better or wow, God helped me with my problem at work or man, my finances were hard, but God helped us to find, you know, how to he opened a Trader Joe's down the road. And so all of a sudden we have cheaper groceries than we've ever had, whatever it is. And you just go, man, God, thank you. Thank you for moving me here for such a time as this and putting these resources around me. And when you start to do that, then the next time a negative thought comes, you're anticipating though, but, but God can do something about this. But if you're stuck in the cycle of the negativity, you're not looking for God to move. You're not looking for God to make a difference. And you really come into a victim mentality. So I'm going to encourage you to practice focusing and looking for what God's doing. Here's some news you need to know. In the fall of 2021, about nine months after President Joe Biden took office, the president of the Southern Poverty Law Center bragged in a donor meeting that many agencies in Biden's administration had approached the center to craft a domestic terrorism strategy. The Southern Poverty Law Center had repeatedly demonized many teachings of Orthodox Christianity as a form of hate. The organization gained its reputation by suing Ku Klux Klan groups into bankruptcy in the 1980s, then took the program it used against the KKK and weaponized it against mainstream conservative Christian organizations. The SPLC published a hate map that plots conservative Christian organizations like the Family Research Council and the Alliance defending freedom alongside chapters of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, the SPLC brands these groups as anti-LGBTQ hate groups, claiming that they demonize people who identify as LGBTQ. Contrary to the SL. 
SP Elsie's claims, neither FRC or ADF demonize people for their sexual orientation or their gender identity. They do, however, advocate for the religious freedom and the biblical view of sexuality in the family. Your local church might be considered a domestic terrorist group, according to their definition, and the Biden administration is backing them up right now. So there's more discrimination against Christianity than we've ever had before. One good news, Alabama can finally enforce a ban on puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones for kids. Appeals court in Alabama can enforce a ban on puberty blockers. According to U.S. News, they may begin enforcing the law uh, outlawing the use of these blocker drugs and cross-sex hormones for minors after a federal appeals court granted a request to stay a preliminary injunction blocking the enforcement of the 2022 ban. The 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals lifted a lower court's injunction Thursday against the state's Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act, and Governor Kay Ivey, a Republican, signed the law in April 2021, which was supposed to go into effect May 2022. The court's order allows the ban to go into full effect while a legal challenge from the families whose children identify as transgender continues. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. We're so glad you were with us today. And I want to encourage you to subscribe on YouTube to this show. And you're going to get new episodes and new video content where we take on each of these stories and put them into full form videos every week. I know many of you are watching aren't subscribed yet, but this is great content that's going to teach you how to discern and help you to navigate. You may not always agree with me, but you're going to know how to navigate through your faith and through your lens of discernment each and every week. I'll see you next time.